Well, hello everyone. Um, been a little while again. I know I keep saying this every time I do a vlog now that it's been a little while since we've done one, um, but it has indeed been a little while since we've done one. So with that in mind, I thought today I would talk about um, essentially a fat loss checklist or like what do you need to know to control your weight? First up, what's been going on with me? So I think it's been four months since I did a last one. I'm gonna try and even maybe do a couple today so I have a couple of these in the bank. So if I do do that, I obviously won't talk about my training and stuff in the subsequent ones, but I wanna get a couple in the bank just so we can start to get this ball rolling again. So um, I have been focusing on powerlifting again. So I had a powerlifting comp in January. Uh, so it's a states qualifier leading to uh, states, which should lead to nationals. So I've also taken up Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Um, so I've been training for that. I had a competition for that. Um, what was it? Late, late February. Um, so that's been really, really hard on my body. Um, so I've essentially let body composition fade as a priority in terms of <clears throat> I'm allowing myself more calories, including junk, because I have to essentially stay under 105 for powerlifting and the heavier I can be for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, the better, since I'm in the open category. So um, I'm certainly not happy with my physique right now, but I have to, I'm accepting it because after I'm finished with um, uh, states, which is two weeks time, and then ADCC for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which is like three or four weeks time, I can do a mini cut and tidy up the shop a little bit. So that's sort of what's going on with me. I'm aiming for about just around a 200, 205 kilo squat, a 145 to 150 bench, and a, honestly, 200 to 215 kilo squat uh, deadlift would be nice in the under 105s, and that should get me a qualifying total to go to states, uh, so nationals, but I don't know, considering there's other boys rocking up with big totals, uh, I may not get an invite, even if I qualify based on that total. Um, and in terms of the ADCC and comp, I haven't trained actually this month in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because I'm peaking for the powerlifting comp. So we'll see how that goes. I'm a white belt, I'm a novice. The other people I'll be rolling against will be big, heavy white belts. So I've been trying to work on my cardio. I've been adding in, um, low impact aerobic and aerobic interval based training here and there just to sort of build up my cardio which was the main problem with my last comp i mean the last comp i had the guy was 120 130 kilos but i was happy with my jiu-jitsu i just i ran out of cardio be that as it may so today i want to talk about the components of fat loss or the, i've got written here fat loss checklist so basically what are the components of fat loss? What are the things you need to think about and worry about when dealing with fat loss? We could potentially do one on weight gain, but I honestly have like two clients who are trying to gain weight, maybe three. So we can talk about that in a little bit. So I think the first thing, and this may not be in specific order, it's the way it popped into my mind. So there may be things I'm missing. There may be things that are not in the correct order, but this is the order I've got. So. First thing that is most important or the main component to fat loss is calories in versus calories out. Now, this has become a big movement lately and I actually did a post about this on Instagram yesterday, which I got some pushback on from a anti-diet culture friend of mine um, in just thinking about is calories in, calories out, screaming that a client's basically just enough to get the job done. No, it is not, um, is my point. And that's what I said to her and that's what we talked about and that's what I clarified in the post. Yes, calories in, calories out is <clears throat> scientifically, when you're talking about the body, the only thing that matters. Um, so how many calories you take in versus how many calories you burn is what we call either maintenance. So when you're taking in as many as you uh, ingest and burn, that's maintenance. Now that's a moving target. We'll talk a little bit about that maybe in diet periodization. And then if you want to lose weight, you burn more calories than you need. And if you want to gain weight, you eat more calories than you burn. The reason it gets complex is because, yes, that is how it's done. But what that means in terms of how to find your maintenance calories, how to find a sustainable deficit, how to do a deficit at all, and keep going through that process through the allotted time frame you need to lose the kind of weight you want to lose, that's where things get tricky. 
So yes, it's just like telling somebody that they have to, you know, like for me, I'm like, okay, 2,800 calories is around your maintenance for this weight, given your steps, activity, sleep, recovery, etc. So to lose weight, you might say three to 500 calorie deficit, but it's not going to stay at that 300 and 500 calorie deficit. And that's how we coach through moving people through smaller and smaller calorie intakes, more and more output as things like um, adaptive thermogenesis happens, which is basically like what we call starvation mode or metabolic downregulation. Basically, as you uh, decrease your calories and your body gets leaner, hunger signals increase and your body decreases metabolism to essentially go, holy shit, I'm dying. I need to, I need to stop this process. And that gets us into the next part, which I have is the components of metabolism. Because the word metabolism is thrown around and I don't think the lay person really knows what that means. Sometimes I even forget. So the components of metabolism are basal metabolic rate. And this is one of the largest parts of the component. And basically all it is, is the calories you burn at rest. And that means to breathe, pump your heart, move blood around your body, all the enzymatic processes, making poo, everything, your stomach churning, um, twitching, all those kind of things, that's basal metabolic rate. That's basically what your body needs to, to maintain its weight before exercise. Another component which was big, really popular during the low carb phase was thermic effect of food. And this is essentially how many calories does your body take to burn food? And the way we know is carbs have, uh, protein has the highest thermic effect of food. And that's why a lot of low carb proponents were pushing that as you know, something to ingest so you can increase your thermic effect of food. We realize now it's actually not that huge, like I think five to 10% of metabolism. So, and there are other reasons, beneficial reasons to ingest protein intake. Um, and then carbohydrates and fats and alcohol is zero, but that's essentially the order of the thermic effect of food. And then we have the two components of exercise, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. We call that NEAT in the industry. And that's basically everything you do outside of the gym. And we, and we track that by steps. Um, and then there's EAT, exercise activity thermogenesis, which is the exercise that you do in the gym, which is actually a pretty small component of, um, of your total metabolism. And something that I think people get really like caught up in, which is what we can now talk about when we talk about like, what should you do in terms of exercise for fat loss? Um, I think particularly new trainers focus really heavily on cardio. And when I talk today, I'm, I'm sort of like, I'm talking about optimizing or really like what I believe to be the best way. It's like the, the reality is if you, are, have you, if you have understood or calculated or worked out through a process, which we can talk about later, how to assess your maintenance calories, you can then set a calorie deficit, which should set you a reasonably predictable rate of loss per week. Now, the reason I don't like to use cardio as a tool per se, immediately, is because we wanna leave some tools in the bank for when things get hard, when we get to that adaptive thermogenesis, when we get to that down regulatory phase. So if you get somebody doing metabolic resistance training, you know, circuits, um, giant sets, tri sets, drop sets, um, escalating density training, you know, time sets, all that kind of stuff, hard interval training, long duration, steady state. I see those as tools to help when we get to a plateau, when we get to a place where you've dropped your calories to as much as, you, as low as you can handle and you don't want to drop them anymore. You've increased your steps from six, seven, eight to nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14,000 per day and you start to like, the weight loss starts to slow. That's what I'm like, that's a perfect time when you're already, so somebody like me on 2800, if I get to around 2000 calories a day, a bit below that, 19, 1800, that is a fucking miserable time for me, I can tell you right now. Like, I, hello Mr. Quedance boy, excuse me, excuse me little man. Um, that is a horrible time for me and I can tell you that I, when I'm at 18, 1900 calories after sustained fat loss period, I don't wanna do shit. So that's the perfect time to go. Now we add in some aerobic intervals, some anaerobic intervals, 
some kind of cardio, whatever, just to assist those steps per day and all those kind of things so I can create a calorie deficit because that's all that cardio does. It burns calories. If you're at maintenance or in a surplus, let's say in a surplus, because if you're at maintenance and do cardio, that can create a calorie deficit. But if you're, at, if you're in a calorie surplus and you try to do cardio to lose body fat, irrespective of being in a calorie deficit, you will not lose weight. Now, that you've got to remember as well that, like we said before, maintenance is a moving target because as you eat more over time, you put on more weight and that becomes your new maintenance, but then you eat more and you put on more weight. And that's why when we come out of dieting phases or whatever, two or three years down the road when we're not tracking, we're actually eating like four or 5,000 calories a day and gaining the, the corresponding weight. So if you're eating, if, let's say for me, if I was eating three, five a day, and, but still doing like cardio for an hour every day, I might be burning three, 400 calories, four, 500 calories. Cause you gotta remember when calculating your calories from cardio, you also burn calories just by living, excuse me, during that time. So it's important to think about this idea of using cardio straight away is like you have to factor in the fact that you would be burning calories anyway during that time, which you need to take off whatever calories you burn in an hour. I might burn, let's say, 100 calories an hour. If I go and do a three or 400 calorie uh, cardio thing, I've actually only really burnt like 200 calories. So if I'm five or 600 calories over maintenance and I go and do an hour of cardio, you got to remember you have the corresponding psychological thing of being like, well, now I can go and eat more because I've done my cardio. But it's like, no, you're already in a calorie surplus even after the cardio. And then if you go and eat more because you've given yourself permission because you've done cardio, you're not eating more. So I like to have the foundation for most fat loss th training things to be strength training. And by strength training, I mean generally hypertrophy training. Some metabolic resistance training can definitely come in with when we're bouncing through plateaus, but I see that as more of the cardio style. Like I would take somebody into pretty, still strength training, cardio metabolic stuff, then going into more really metabolic resistance training, less focus on the weight, just more focus on reps, decrease rest time circuit, metabolic stuff. Then move to just hardcore cardio stuff with weights really being supportive. But if you start out with somebody doing strength training, focusing on PRs, there's multiple reasons why you can do that aside from these reasons. Like giving somebody like PR goals can help give them something to focus on other than fat loss, which can become all encompassing and really warp your perspective. So if you can get somebody in the gym and being like tracking a small rate of increase, 2.5 kilos per week on their squat, bench, deadlift, chin up, row, military press, gives them something extremely to work towards. But it also builds the main component of metabolism, basal metabolic rate. Increase your muscle mass, increase your basal metabolic rate, increase the calories you burn at rest, raise your maintenance calories, all those kind of things. And what, we, and what they say is, what builds muscle preserves muscle. So when you're in a fat loss phase, muscle can be a, a, a fuel. Like, I mean, I think it's a pound of fat is 3,500 calories, a pound of muscle is about 550 calories, but it's still calories. So we wanna try and do the things that preserve muscle mass. <clears throat> and then saving cardio as a tool. Um, so that's, that's typically how I do things. And when people start to plateau, when they get to sort of the last phase of a 12 week, 15 week cut, that's when I'm like, cardio time. Go for runs, go for interval training, get your steps up, whatever you need to do, go do it because that's the tool we use to break through those plateaus. And I've got a client doing this right now. Excuse me, over about 12 weeks, I think we lost two, three kilos in the last phase with adding cardio and smashing it. She's again lost another two or three kilos. She's on track for about a six kilo. And this girl's tiny already. She's on track for a six kilo loss over about 15 weeks, just by really hammering down on that, that last phase. My saving cardio is a tool to use later. And she's also stronger and such now that she used to complain of shin spins when she ran, all these kind of issues. Now she's running for like half an hour straight in a calorie deficit after 12 to 15 weeks and experiencing no pain or discomfort. It's like, those are all wins. If you'd started just at cardio, 
what do you do? So you're doing maybe one or two days weights and then you're doing the rest cardio. So what, you're at 45 minutes, then you're at an hour. By 15 weeks, you're at an hour and a half, two hours of cardio per day and not really seeing much movement. So that's my philosophy behind it. So that's calories out. So in terms of calories in food, how do we optimize feeling full because you've got to remember when you decrease calories over time, there's even things like sensors in your stomach that just go like, my fucking stomach is empty most of the time. This sucks, fill it. So we have hormones like leptin and ghrelin and those kind of things that regulate hunger and satiety and they all get skewed. When you're, when you're in a maintenance and a surplus, they even get skewed the other way where you're like, I think, believe, I think it's leptin makes you feel hungry. So it comes down, ghrelin comes up, so you feel full and it's really hard to get like, when you're in a persistent bulk and stuff like that, it's a little bit hard. That's why people resort to junk food and fatty foods, high sugar foods, low processed foods. When you diet, the body fat starts to come down and you're in a like low calorie intake for a while, ghrelin really gets depleted and leptin starts to increase. And that's why it's like the thing I always push people with fat loss, don't even mind protein for muscle building and like for health and all that kind of stuff. It's literally what foods can we ingest to make us feel full longer? So protein, fiber, and vegetables, <coughs> and then carbs too, are the most satiating foods. So whatever we do with our fat loss in terms of diet, protein should be at the forefront. It should be high fiber, nutrient dense, low processed, um, vegetables and foods. And that'll mean carbs and grains and stuff as well. Things with fiber are digested slowly, have high food volume, so they make you feel full. I always tell clients, get a bowl of green leafies, diced up carrots, tomatoes, all that kind of stuff and eat it like a big bowl and eat that with dinner. You will feel full all evening. And that's a really nice feeling when you're in fat loss phase. Um, and that would probably be at my heart of cr like criticisms like low carb and maybe vegan. Like vegan can be good because it's um, usually high food volume, but the protein is tricky to get. It's not impossible by no means, but you're taking people who already don't eat a lot of protein, probably a lot of fiber, and then giving them an overly restricted diet. When you're giving people diets for fat loss, my whole thing is like, eat whatever the fuck you want. Just make sure it's got a lot of protein and a lot of fiber, some carbs and vegetables. Minimize fats because they just don't have satiating effects. Um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't eat any fats. It's just when you're selecting foods, stay away from liquids, stay away from protein shakes, Stay away from sodas and orange juices and all those kind of things because liquids move through the gut fast. So you can have your protein bars or you can have a protein shake with food, those kind of things. But we should be having meals semi-regularly throughout the day just so we're, we're keeping that hunger response blunted. And then obviously you need to be in a calorie deficit. So that means you need to know how much maintenance is. You need to know how much um, of a deficit you need. And then there's things like tracking your weight and steps and things like that are useful tools. And that's what, like a lot of women in particular are like, I don't weigh myself. And I'm like, I can understand why, but it's also just a tool. With, like there is no fat loss without weight loss. There is no fat loss without weight loss. If you're talking about body recomposition and stuff like that, as I've talked to with clients before, that's happening at like a one to four ratio. You would lose, need to lose something like one kilo if you're obese and or overweight and on a strength training program to gain 250 kilos of muscle, probably over an eight to 12 week period in relatively untrained individuals. If you're losing weight, you're losing fat. You're losing water in there and that's why we weigh a couple of times a week, but it's, it's not like, oh, I'm not losing weight, but my body composition is improving, which may happen because body composition is improving all the time. But I guarantee you, if you're overweight and you're not losing weight, you are not losing fat at the rates that I'm sure you want. So calorie deficit, and then find ways to stay in that calorie deficit through c consumption of fiber, vegetables, protein, meals, not liquids. 
Another thing to think about is sleep and recovery. The longer you diet for, the leaner you get, leaner, the leaner you get, the harder it's going to be to recover. Training stimulus is going to be harder to recover from because you don't have the calories to fuel recovery. Protein synthesis is down and that will affect sleep too. So a lot of people on fat loss diets reporting sleeping nine hours a night and waking up exhausted. And those are the things we need to think about when we're talking about the last thing I wanna talk about, which is diet periodization. The way we find recovery in fat loss is by setting a goal, eight, 12, 15, 16 weeks, and that's where we push. We start off relatively aggressive, but we push through it, and as things start to plateau, that's when we get assertive with cardio and extra things that can really help us. But then we take you out of that, we take you to maintenance, we give you four to six weeks of focusing on strength training and recuperating, recouping some of that strength we lost, and gaining maybe a little bit of muscle mass, feeling healthy again, recovering, sleeping better, getting your, um, your body restored, healed, um, and then we focus on another cut if we need to. But diet periodization is how we get it done. If you have 30, 40 kilos to lose, we set a goal for 12 weeks of a rate of loss of 0.5 to 1% of body weight per week. And honestly, general population really struggles to get the 0.5% because they're not experienced dieters and that's no criticism. They're just not experienced dieters. They're just people who are working jobs and having kids and trying to find ways to lose weight without making as many changes as they need to because they're, it's like me with my car or when you go to the dentist. Every time I go to my mechanic or my dentist, my, they're both like, Rob, what the fuck are you doing to your car and your teeth? You need to floss more. You need to change the oil more and all those kind of things. I'm like, I'm working 55 hours a week and I train in two sports, fuck off. I get it. But periodization is how we get people from the goal weight that they want. We chip, let's say they're a 60 kilo person, so we want 300 grams to 600 grams per week. So 10 weeks we're looking for a three to six kilo loss. I know that doesn't sound like much, but if you do that over 10 to 12 weeks, you spend six to eight weeks maintaining that with a maintenance phase, you do another one of those, within 30 weeks you've lost 12 kilos, you know, like six to 12 kilos, you've gotten stronger, leaner, bigger, faster, look better, maintained it, kept it off. And that's where finally we can talk about the anti-diet culture stuff that's going around that right now. Maybe that's not in the gen pop space, but just briefly, there's a lot of pushback against dieting and its ability to work. And I think diet periodization solves that. I've mentioned this before, but it's just like getting somebody to lose weight over 20 weeks as opposed to 12 weeks where you just immediately put them in a thousand calorie deficit, get them doing cardio every day is how they bounce back because they haven't learned how to lose the weight and keep it off. I think that's everything we need to talk about today. Um, if there's any questions or, or if I've missed anything, do let me know and I'll, I'll add it in in a subsequent video. I hope this has been helpful. I hope, I honestly, at this point for my viewers, I hope I'm just going over the same stuff that we've always talked about. But for new people, this is probably what I'll be sending you to help you get you towards your goals moving forward. Peace out, fam.